Hi everyone and welcome to Indie Geek Live. Welcome to uh, the last of my pre-show live streams. Uh, this is for episode six. I will be doing another live stream next week at the same time just to sort of round off on the series. But uh, this is the last of my pre-show live streams and I am delighted uh, to be able to introduce my guest today. There are very few true legends within this community, but the man we have on today certainly is one of them. Aziz, do you want to say hi? I do. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. What a momentous day it is for the Game of Thrones fandom. And it's really fun to be sharing it uh, in, in a group because that's what makes this all so much extra fun is uh, the group discussions and the fandom and all the friendships. It's the real, the real Azor Ahai is the friends we made along the way, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'll put that on a t-shirt, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the kind of thing, take to Color Thrones with you. The real Azor Ahai are all my friends. Yeah. Uh, stabbing <laughs> everyone else to make <laughs> Uh Okay, well, look, let, let's go. Uh, guys, the way we're going to do this is uh, the way we've done the previous uh, episodes is that we will uh, be picking up as many questions as we can from the chat as we go through. Obviously, if there's any super chats, I'll get to them as soon as we can. Probably most of the time we're going to be focusing on what's happening in the next episode in just a few hours' time. But if there are any other questions from last episode, please do drop them in there and we'll try and uh, get to them uh, as we can. Uh, why don't we just start off, Aziz, just like what's, what's your overall view of how the season's gone and, and what we might be expecting in broad terms uh, for the finale? Okay, well, I think like a lot of people, it's uh, there's it's got its highs and its lows. The so much of it has been great, and so much of it has uh, been worthy of criticism. There's a lot of there's a feeling of it being rushed. You'd love to see some of these things maybe have taken a little more time to play out. But it, upon analysis, if you really think about it and imagine how it might, uh, like imagine all the details and and picture all the gaps being filled in. It's still a really amazing experience. The the acting and the music are still top notch, and uh, I'm very curious to see what they do with it. Because regardless of whether you like it or not, it's given us a lot to think about with regard to the books. Things we didn't necessarily see coming. Things that we have to look at in a different light. So it's created a lot of discussion. Even you know, on my I don't know about in your case, Robert, but on over on our channel, some of the most uh, people we've had attend our live streams were after the most divisive episodes. So that's just um, not necessarily, uh, obviously we want it to be great, but even when it's not, there's still a lot of good to come from it. Yeah, absolutely. I think the 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 chat and engagement that has been amazing all the way through this, um, I, I would certainly agree. So, so the amount of people coming onto these live streams sometimes has been quite mind boggling. And thank you so much, by the way, everyone, for your support through this. It's the, the opportunity to just be able to chat about something that I really love is amazing. So thank you. I just want to uh, pick up on a few super chats we had before we went live. Uh, Maura Lee, uh, thank you. Very generous super chats. Uh, saying, just my usual show of love and support. Looking forward to episode six and the documentary on the 26th. For those who don't know, yes, there's going to be next week at the same time that they've been airing the episodes, HBO are going to be showing a, a documentary about Game of Thrones, which sounds like it's going to be quite good. I know they got a lot of the old cast in, people like Sean Bean came back for that as well. So uh, that should be something to be looking forward to too. Amora says, uh, uh, thank you to Robert and Aziz for your fabulous content. Uh, love everything you do, and Aziz, especially the kitties. Uh, so there you go. Although I understand that they were quite naughty kitties just before we went on there. <laughs> they might make an appearance nonetheless. You never know. We'll see. <laughs> um, we'll see. Excellent. And uh, uh, R.I. Uh, Severa says, just to say thank you as we reach the end. As a young mum, your engaging uh, debates and incredible narrator's voice, thank you, uh, have kept me sane through many long nights. Thank you. I really appreciate that. We got a couple of questions from Kevin White's sides. Um, the first one, uh, sort of a technical one, I guess, uh, wasn't Brand's vision from Drogon or Danny's point of view. This, I assume, is a reference to um, if you think back a couple of seasons when Bran had that download of uh, images and visions when he was leaving Blood Raven's cave, one of those was a shot of the shadow of the dragon passing over King's Landing, and we finally saw that happen this last episode. So uh, what would you make of that one, Aziz? Does, is there, can we take anything from the fact that this was from a sort of a top-down perspective? 
I think so. It's been something we've been waiting for. That vision, that shadow passing over King's Landing always seemed like it was something that would happen because it didn't really fit with anything in history, even though the other visions uh, were part history and part uh, potentially something coming. And in the case of the wildfire explosion in that in that vision, it was definitely something coming. In the case of the Mad King saying burn them all, in the case of Jamie stabbing him in the back, those were obviously visions of the past. But given those two things put together, we've if you check off the boxes of which scenes we've seen uh, play out and which ones we haven't, um, it could be what we're faced with again. We have a, a king, the daughter, uh, or a queen rather, the daughter of the Mad King who had intended to lay destruction on King's Landing and now we see it happening. And it would be pretty ironic if these actions, if her actions ended the Iron Throne or uh, ended her family's dynasty when her intent was to uh, rebuild it. It'd be kind of like how she's sort of an anagram or rather an anagram, an anagram, <laughs> a parallel for uh, her ancestor, Egg on the Conqueror. It would be interesting if she were the one to end the dynasty that he created. Uh, he created the Iron Throne if she were the one to end it, not not necessarily on intentionally. It doesn't look like she's doing that intentionally, but no. it, you know, it could be what happens. Uh, Kind of like how the the we see the the Iron Throne as a as a parallel to the One Ring, and that is certainly what had to happen in the end. It had to be destroyed. Uh, yeah, I think I agree, I think I agree with that. Absolutely, the the idea that the Iron Throne has to go is that the symbol of power, which is the thing that has been corrupting and causing so much damage. I think that does have to go. Um, just in terms of answering the specific question about the brand's vision being from Drogon or Danny's point of view, I don't think that that's a specific uh, thing that we need to learn anything about. I think um, if you remember back, the we saw Jaime killing the the Mad King Eris the Second from another perspective, from neither of their perspective. And as far as we know, there wasn't another witness to that. So it's not that we're seeing a particular person's point of view in those visions. It's just them showing us things that happened. Um, and uh, your other question, uh, Kevin, saying, will John learn to lie this episode? Uh, quite possibly. I'm sure we'll get onto this in a, a bit more detail in just a moment. Um, but uh, the... I. The way I see the first half of this episode is very much it's going to pick up straight away after pretty much give or take a few minutes after the end of the last episode. And so we're going to see John and Davos and Tyrion uh, and Arya all facing up to them. How do they respond to what Danny has done? And so I think for me, that's going to be the, the first half of this episode is going to be dealing with that. Um, Maximum conflict. Yeah. Well, exactly. And I think the first thing, incidentally, is that the first thing for Danny is going to have to be, well, what happened to Cersei? Because mm -hmm. that's the whole point. Of it. And if she finds Cersei or if one of her people finds Cersei, they will also find Jamie. If they find Jamie, she will immediately know that Tyrion did betray her again. So I think immediately we're going to have Tyrion in trouble. So there's, a, there's going to be a lot going on in that. It's actually quite a small cast because they've killed quite a lot of people who were there. So actually we've only got half a dozen or so people there. Um, let, I'm gonna throw something to you uh, that I know was discussed over, uh, I did the Nawi um, live stream uh, this week and I saw that uh, Emma Smith on there was, uh, Mr. Emma was discussing this idea. Lucas Giorgio says, um, thank you for all your appreciates, thank you. Um, I'm hoping Sansa becomes queen with the capital moving to Winterfell or somewhere else. So do you think, Aziz, that there's, there's a chance if King's Landing has all largely been destroyed, if we're agreed on the fact that the Iron Throne itself will be destroyed, if probably following up from that, the biggest political actor left is going to be Sansa, is there any chance that she, the centre of ruling might actually move away from King's Landing? Yes and no. I think if the if the Iron Throne is destroyed, I think it's more likely that there's independent realms again. I don't think they would accept a new uh, ruler 
in the north uh, to rule the south uh i don't see that happening specifically but i could see that if we have a scenario without the iron throne if that is indeed what happens then sansa being in charge in the north i don't think she would crown herself or be crowned i think it might be she would just call herself lady the lady of winterfell or something like that uh because i don't think john wants it i don't think he would in, in, intend for that i don't think it's i don't even think he would necessarily be that great at it in in a, in a peacetime situation uh i think sansa is more skilled and um more suited for the role so yes i think her maintaining a position of leadership in the end is is likely and i think that to tie into the earlier question there daenerys is going to see santa as a threat almost as much as anyone and that could be an interesting parallel if we get john sticking to his honesty sticking to his honor despite what's happened he's openly pledged to, to daenerys uh, and that's difficult for him to back out of an oath like that but if it comes down to like it did for ned in the black cells ned was willing to die until Varus put Sansa's life in front of him and said, well, you know, is your honor worth more than your daughter's life? And that flipped the switch for Ned. Now that could be this, a similar situation for John where John would be willing to go down with the ship because of his honor and being so stubborn. But if it's, if it comes down to someone else's life like Sansa, then that would, that would motivate him. I think to break a vow, the kind of, uh, the kind of thing that would get him to break a vow like it did when he was uh, in the night's watch, when it was for somebody else. Yeah, I I agree. And I think thematically, this will end, or it probably won't end, I think partway through the episode, Danny will die. I think she will be killed. I think there's only a small number of people who could do that, which we were talking about a moment ago. Yeah. Um, I think thematically, it works strongest if it's John who kills her. Uh, and... Uh, I I was talking about this on the other stream, but I did a video ages ago, um, a couple of years ago, based on something completely different, which was Danny's visions in the House of the Undying in the books. And I came out from that, I'm not going to give the whole logic there, with the idea that John would probably end up killing Daenerys in a kind of Zora High Nisa Nisa way. And so I th I wonder whether they're going to keep that end the ending but have it in a slightly different context here on the show. So that's my take on where we might be going with this. Um, but in terms of people dying, Dornish Dan, uh, thank you so much for the super chat, just says Davos was part of the plot to save Cersei and Jaime. He was, Tyr Tyrion asked him to leave aside that little boat effectively, and he did. Will Danny kill him? Another fan favorite, Toasted. Uh, what do you reckon on that one, Aziz? Is there any chance that... Tyrion presumably is going to be in for um, judgment from uh, Danny. Do you think uh, that she will be able to figure out that Davos was part of this as well? It's possible, but she he wouldn't necessarily know who who it was for. I'm not sure that Davos ever knew who the the boat was for because he was told to leave it and go. Obviously, he didn't stay there with the boat because he was in the battle. Uh, so he has some plausible deniability. On the other hand, that may not be enough if if it's about making uh, instilling fear and showing, uh, you know, being a hardliner, then the details don't necessarily matter. It's the appearance. And if he's the, if, if there's the appearance of treason, then that has to be punished. Uh, it's the uh, kind of the optics that matter more than the truth of the matter, uh, the way she's set out so far, uh, whether she stays on that course, we'll have to see. I kind of expect that she will, because that's the more conflicting, more tragic way for things to go. Obviously, if she just feels bad about what she does, she did and, and says, I'm sorry, then where's the conflict <laughs> she just we're well, all... <laughs> yeah I, i'm fully expecting her to double down on it and just yeah. come up with some bizarre she she started trying to come up with rationalizations last episode before doing it yeah um she so looks back I, she's lost it's that same kind of attitude yeah exactly so I, i'm not expecting her to suddenly go oh, oh oh my gosh what have i done uh i don't think that's what's gonna she will think she has now done what she's always said she was gonna do yeah Claim what is hers by fire and blood, and so I and think it seems that like it was. It would seem like it may have been premeditated in the first place. The you know uh, one theory is that uh, based on the conversation with Grey Worm and and all this other stuff that she, the bells weren't 
something that made her angry. It was a frustration that she wanted more of this blame to fall on Cersei because she had intend always intended to wreak havoc, uh, to have more, you know, more ability to rule by fear since love was no longer an option given that those other scenes. So yeah, uh, looking at the, it pays to look at this in the premeditated angle as well, as dark as that is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's certainly an element to that and she has, as many people have noted, she has, at the very least threatened to burn down many cities so the thought is in her mind uh and whether or not she actually sat down and planned to do that beforehand i think is is you know you could take that either way but clearly she had been thinking about that as a possibility um and i think incidentally i think the bells are a complete distraction i think that the bells were just that gave her the moment to pause and decide what to do next and that's when she looked at the Red Keep and made up her mind. So I think that's what the bells were about. I don't think that the bells triggered anything per se. I think that was agree, a, yeah. a reason for a pause. Um, it was cinematic Lath too. Yeah. Yeah. Lathan Carl 22 says, hey, guys, do you have any theories that might help the series end on that bittersweet note? Uh, so I think a lot of people have tried to uh, pick up on this. I, if you've watched my live streams a lot of times, you'll know that I... I don't like dissecting the word bittersweet too much because George R. R. Martin very rarely just sort of says it's going to be bittersweet, everything's going to be bittersweet. He then goes on to use other analogies like uh, the scouring of the Shire as the feeling in the, that he's going for and that kind of stuff. But it's certainly true that at the moment uh, we're getting a lot of what looks like bitter stuff. <laughs> yeah. uh, where, where do you, other than Sam and Gilly living happily ever after, which I'm going to take as given. Uh, where, where else is there good in this? Well, if the resolution of the Iron Throne situation is relatively positive, there's some sweetness there, even though it's involves all these characters that we have no attachment to. If we hear that things are great in Dorne from the rest of the way out, that's nice, I guess. But we don't know a single Dornish character <laughs> at this point. Uh, but it's something uh, that would certainly count if, if, if it's if it's the only thing, if that's the only piece of sweetness, then that's definitely lacking. But I suppose if you know, let's say that the Iron Throne isn't destroyed and uh, someone decent is uh, put upon it, that's a reasonable uh, that's both bitter and sweet. The fact that they still have this corrupting bloody symbol uh, that could at any point turn to tyranny, depending on who inherits it next. But in the meantime, it, it might land on someone good. And that's, you know, that's bitter and sweet, I suppose. As far as other yeah. characters surviving, yeah, you got Tormund and Ghost, you know, maybe romping around in the north. They're, uh, they're, they're happy. Maybe you, maybe they, uh, find some, maybe Ghost finds a, uh, a lady friend, not lady friend. <laughs> that's 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 too soon. But you know what I mean. <laughs> I, do, I, I do, and I and I still favour the the Frodo ending of John heading up north, uh, broken by this world and his part in in everything that's happened, and and just heading up as he was invited to just go beyond the wall and hang out with Tormund and Ghost. So I still like that as a sort of an, an ending there, and I think that would be quite. He's a, he was never looked happier than those few seconds when he was laughing and joking with them in episode four, I have to say. And I would agree that we we kind of downplay it and we're trying to look at character arcs and all the rest of it. But the big point is that if we have got rid of the army of the dead and if dragons uh, burning cities to the ground is at an end, that's a good thing for humanity. This is this is a win, and we shouldn't just brush it aside and say, "Well, that's the end of that story." No, that is a that is a good thing, and it has been bought by an awful lot of pain, and that as an overall theme is kind of bittersweet, I would argue. Um, uh, but uh, Miss M Dubs says, "Will there be a great council?" Um, so, and combining that with Great on Twenty Seven saying, "What role do you see Sam and Davos doing?" if John takes the throne, also what major houses get new lords. So I think that if we wrap these up together, uh, Aziz, what do you, if, if we take as an assumption that Danny ruling from the Iron Throne uh, through fear is not how this is all going to end, what do you think is the likely end game in how they sort of carve all this up going forward? 
Well, it would have to be one of the few characters that's left that is a named character that is shown to be competent or not uh, corrupted or evil or, or what have you. And that's really, given what left few we have, there's not many options. There, you know, you could say uh, they could have been sneaky with Daenerys granting Storm's End to Gendry, giving him a path to the throne, kind of backdoor, because he, without John being acknowledged out there at that moment, Gendry immediately became her heir. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, yeah, I sense. picked up on that one as well. Right? Uh, it, he would, it would be funny if he just pulls out a couple daggers and just kills them both. And I am king. Just <laughs> right then, he kills John and Danny, and that's it. Uh, he, but he had to wait for Cersei to go down first. So he's waiting. He's waiting to make his move. He's going to sneak up behind Danny with his hammer. No one will see that coming. <laughs> but it, I think that, uh, so get someone like, but, but the, on the other hand, Gendry just said to Arya that he barely knows how to use a fork. He's not exactly experienced even a little in this sort of thing. And he would be like, as far as his disposition and his character. Yeah. I, you could do a lot worse, but as far as experience and ability to, politic and deal with nobles and know what the heck is going on with taxation and things like that he has no idea uh on the other hand you could have someone like sansa who is politically savvy but um not necessarily aiming for something like the the iron throne and then you have the uh more tinfoily like everyone's favorite would be davos because he's the best guy, you know, the best person in a lot of ways. Uh, besides, some people would say John is, but John clearly doesn't want it. And John also wouldn't necessarily be a good ruler because he's too stubborn and and uh, rigid and things like that and reluctant. So then you have to go with, then after that, you have uh, Bran, who would be, uh, who is the gambler's favorite right now. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, because he has all these... Thing. Yeah, he has all these strange conversations with Tyrion and he has these, he refers to the thing, he specifically has painted it very indirectly as as the type of king that would that would be ideal and that he has no wants or ambitions or, and he has all of human history at his disposal to see the mistakes that past kings have made. And he would be pretty impossible to conspire against. Uh, <laughs> and... Um, he would also potentially last a long time. And yep. the merit there too is they haven't had a great council in the show or books. And it's been foreshadowed via history being it happening twice. And generally George gives us these big historical events to foreshadow some sort of thing like it in the future. And a situation where we don't have a, a clear king and one has to be picked. Well, there you go. That, that's how it could happen. And, yeah, uh, and and for those I should say who didn't pick up on those the the rather vague hints that he might be a good king that they dropped us there were Tyrion and Varys together chatting that, about uh, why John might be a good king because he didn't want it and Tyrion also was talking to uh, Bran and saying about being Lord of Winterfell and then going you don't want to be Lord of Winterfell or words to that effect and Bran saying yeah. I don't want anything um so that was the kind of the hints there i mean i think the other th other thing uh, i mean i don't like this idea of brand being king i think mm -hmm. in terms of the day-to-day -day ruling i think he would be ridiculously poor uh but be, be that as it may thematically he isn't bran yeah. and we have to remember this so actually if you put him as ruler actually what you're doing is create is putting as ruler the the memories of humanity and saying that is yeah rulers which i kind of thematically understand uh but in reality i can't see that it would work but anyway, there's, I, there's two other things that are really quick about it that that might give people something else to think about Two beyond the great council foreshadowing there's the the character of egg on the third who is the one who emerges from the ashes of the dance of the dragons to become this king that is he's very unhappy he's the broken king he doesn't eat he does you know he's it, that's you know, I, 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 myself and a lot of people noted how much he's like Egg on the Third or like Jon Snow. But if you look at him like Bran, that works really well as well. And then also the thing that 
is a, a, a silver lining to this brand idea is that in order in order for this to happen, in order for this brand idea to get pushed forward, in order for a grand council to happen, because the person who had all these conversations with him is Tyrion, it means Tyrion has to survive. It means Tyrion has to not be killed by Danny because he would be the one to bring this idea forward. And there's no one else that could. No one else knows these things at this point. No one else had those conversations. So, hey, you know, <laughs> a little hope for Tyrion after all. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, so Tony 3483 saying cheers to the mods. You're amazing. I completely back that. Uh, my moderators are fantastic. Thank you, guys. I can see you're doing amazing work again today. Um, just in case anyone needs reminding, no spoilers here. Um, the moderators have got uh, full authority to zap any spoilers that appear and also to block you so no one can actually see you again on this chat. So uh, that's it's, it's not worth it. Um, and a Dark Mother saying, speaking of Chekhov, no giant wolf pack. No, I don't think, um, I don't think there will be a giant wolf pack. I think the, the, um, the technical difficulties of getting the wolves have been much discussed within the community. And I think that the, the, the fleeting glimpses of ghosts that we've been getting this season is all we're gonna get. In the books, yeah, I think that Nymeria's wolf pack definitely will play a role. Uh, on the show, I can't see that they will, no. Um, Helena von Lundstein, make Mordor great again. Hi, Helen. Uh, Hi, saying, Alan. I <laughs> just want Drogon to survive and fly away to Valyria, lay some eggs and be like, F you people, I'm off. Uh, <laughs> can I put this one to you then, Aziz? So, the, the Drogon is the... I was going to say the elephant in the room. That might have been if Cersei had survived. He's the dragon in the room. <laughs> if uh, <laughs> if um, if Danny dies and is killed, Drogon will, in some way, uh, get a little bit angry. So, to my mind, oh. there are, yeah, <laughs> to my mind, there are only two options here: either someone kills Drogon, yeah. or Drogon, as Helen suggests, flies off to Valyria, which is not. That's not a cop out. It's, it's something uh, that Balerion the Black Dread, who Drogon is, is a, in many ways a kind of a mirror for, it did fly off to, to there. And we've got, we've seen him be there uh, a few seasons ago, flying around there. Mm -hmm. What do you think will happen with Drogon? I think that Drogon will die. I think that there's this long-running Chekhov's bow thing with Arya that has to be resolved somehow, and I really don't see Arya killing Danny with a bow shot, uh, so it kind of has to be Drogon. I just don't see who else it could be. I mean, maybe she has to kill Grey Worm or something like that. I, I don't. I kind of doubt that, though. Uh, so it really seems like she just they just keep showing her hitting really tiny targets it's from episode one, season one, and then twice this season when she's with Gendry. And she's just always nailing this really tiny bullseye. And, well, hitting a dragon in the eyeball would be pretty perfect for that. Uh, it, it's, I really do love the idea of him going back to Valyria, though. I totally agree it's been foreshadowed as a possibility. And if they go that route, I think it's be pretty cool. They could even go both. Maybe, you know, Arya shoots Drogon in the eyeball and it doesn't kill him and he flies off. <laughs> <laughs> something yeah. like that you yeah. know you could even have our our, our cake and eat it too <laughs> well yeah quite i mean i think it's uh, uh i i think the aya uh, just just thinking in terms of so the aya's like uh, sort of plot line in on the show clearly he's been training as this uh kick-ass assassin and then her big moment was killing the night king in the books she has also been training as this kick-ass assassin, but the Night King's not there. So she will have some other big thing, I think, that she will end up killing. It's possible that that's Cersei, but Drogon is also very much a possibility here. Um, so yeah, I like the idea that maybe she does uh, fire an arrow at him and uh, he does fly off. That's, that, that works doing uh, all the things we want to happen. Uh, Paul West says, uh, Entertainment Weekly's Hibbard uh, said he was shocked by actors he didn't expect to see in the finale. Uh, Rhaegar flashback, flash forward, Great Council thoughts. Now, I haven't seen, the, I assume this is um, either a tweet or an article or something. I haven't seen this, so I don't know the context for it. Do you know, Aziz, what the context for this one was? 
I believe I've seen similar in that I've heard about that without delving into it, but there's not a whole lot of possibilities. Uh, but it does make sense that Daenerys being now crowned would call for different people to come kneel uh, to her, you know, to pledge fealty like Joffrey. I will have oaths of fealty from my loyal counselors and all that. So she, you could see, yeah, it's perfect, right? You just thought yeah, I was yeah. Jack Leeson just for, <laughs> <laughs> and like, I guess that's, that's an opportunity for, I mean, Jan Royce wouldn't be a surprise, but he would be an example of a, a Lord that would have to come and kneel to her, but say Edmure Tully or gosh, who else is there? There's really, there's no Tyrells. There's no Tarleys. There's no Dornit. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, the, the way I see it is that there's, uh, Varys was writing to some people. Yeah. Uh, and also, as you say, Daenerys would probably want people to come and pay fealty. So I see the sort of the second half of this is that people will amass at King's Landing. So I think yeah. Sansa will come down. If she comes down, Brienne's going to come down. I can well imagine Sam will come down as well to see what's going on. In terms, there are some sort of forgotten characters like Edmure Tully, who it would make sense that he came down. Robin Arryn. Uh, oh, yeah, Robin Arryn. That's still a good one. kicking about. We had a passing reference to the new Prince of Dawn, uh, yep. whoever that might be. So so I think it's entirely possible, which is a couple of people here have been talking about great councils. It's entirely possible that those characters are all going to appear at, and they might not get much sort of action, but just sort of be there if they're going to do a great council yeah. and they would have to include characters like that, I would say. And yes, it might be a little bit surprising if, you, if you'd said, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, Robin Aaron's going to be there at the final, the final scene. You go, what, really? What? So you know who yeah. else we could, who, who we didn't think of. There's another possibility is uh, there's some, one of those guys from the Citadel. If there's a great council, you definitely yeah. will expect the Archmaesters to be involved. So you could have, uh, yeah. what's his face? That guy that had the scenes with Sam, <laughs> Ebros or whoever it was. Uh, yeah, Archmaester Ebros. Yeah, so he could certainly turn up. I mean, I think that there's, this is the, they could call people in from all over the place. You could conceivably imagine the Iron Bank suddenly appearing and saying, yeah, yeah. Oh, right, but you're, you're now in charge. This is how much you owe us. And so I, I think that the, the <laughs> first half is that immediate aftermath. Yeah. The second half will be everybody coming in together to figure out what next in some way, yeah. shape, or form. If if it, the, if the Iron Bank stuff doesn't go well, then maybe Jack and Agar appears also. <laughs> yeah, well, let's, let's, let's bring them all in. So that Dario <laughs> Naharis comes, comes to in the rescue. To see what's going on? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, um, okay. Let's. We're, we're getting behind on super chat. So um, let's quickly pick up uh, Lady Shah. Thank you so much for yours. And Drew Rosier didn't see a question on either of them. Uh, I know my. Um, uh, my moderators are keeping an eye out, so uh, they will let me know if there were questions there. Uh, but thank you both for that. Uh, Fräulein Mietz says, uh, thank you both for all your great videos and live streams. Really enjoy every minute of it. Thank you. Um, and then uh, Doug B says, uh, perhaps Danny tries to burn John, but he survives. Yep, that's entirely possible. I think, though, that it's more likely uh, that he, uh, that she won't immediately take out her wrath on him. She will want him to be paying fealty to her, which is where this idea of will he lie comes in. Somebody was asking earlier, because if he's going to get close enough to her to kill her as I have speculated, then a lie is probably what's needed at that point, which gets back to the Ned Stark thing, as Ease was talking about a while ago. And Ethan Wilkins says, I think we can all agree that Sansa is that girl. Uh, well, I think Sansa is going to be left in an incredibly powerful position after all of this. Um, uh, Elizabeth, e, let's uh, throw this one to you, Aziz. Elizabeth e 213 says, uh, do you guys think A Song of Ice and Fire can also apply to the big battles against ice and fire uh, that were always the real threats. By the way, love your channel and these chats. So um, I, I think that I'll, I'll kind of, if, if you want to pick up on that as is, as is, that's great, as is, as is, uh, then that's great. But uh, my big theory here is that this is the Song of Ice and Fire is about these two big opposite forces, ice and fire. And we've spent huge amounts of time focusing in on this battle against ice. And what we saw last time 
might have been rushed, might have been lots of other things, but this was the fire, the other huge force that could destroy the world. So, so what do you think about this idea about the uh, Song of Ice and Fire applying to these big battle against, battles against ice and fire? Well, I think that's part of the clue. I agree with what you said. And to add to that, part of the idea of a song is uh, built into it is motifs, repetition, and things like that. And that we we see that in the world of A Song of Ice and Fire with history repeating itself. And that's why so much of our theorizing uh, is rooted in what he's written into the history books, uh, the world of ice and fire and fire and blood, things like that. We, we, we look to the foreshadowing, uh, in the past, it's the old mantra that he himself wrote to in, um, the first book there, if, uh, or is it the second book <laughs> to go forward? You must go back <laughs> that line, that good line there. And, it's of course he does it in all the other ways too the traditional foreshadowing and then dreams of characters and prophecies and all the all the elements he uses really well and he blends them super well but he he has the the historical foreshadowing is something he does even more so than most other authors and some authors don't even have that available you can't exactly do historical foreshadowing in uh i don't know uh regular romance novels like how do you do that like 30 years ago my grandmother and had the same <laughs> relationship would know that uh, yeah you just it doesn't quite work <laughs> without these large kingdoms and dynasties and houses and thousands of years of history so he blends it all so well and it, it, songs are like that songs are a blend of so many uh, of, of themes and ideas and emotions and thoughts and the lyrics can tell a story while the emo the, the, the harmony can take your take your emotions a certain place and it has repetition to it. And it has uh, all these, all these ideas and things. I don't really know where I'm going with this. Now I'm just rambling, but I think it's uh, it's, it's really just a wonderful thing that he, the way he puts it all together like that. I, th I think you're rambling in the way that we all are in our hearts at the moment when we're doing, <laughs> contemplating the end of all of this and trying to encapsulate what, what does this all mean? How does this all hang together? Actually, yeah. I, I don't think I gave you the chance at the beginning. For those who don't know, what what is your, your channel, your, your podcast? Just give us a little bit of a sell about who you are and what you do. Sure. Well, yeah, that's that. This this question was very much an answer to that uh, that question as well, which is our channel has always been uh, uh, obsessed with the Song of Ice and Fire, and we we come at it from a variety of angles. But I'd say our specialty is looking at all the the world building and backstory that George has built, and how much it speaks to what's coming. One of the best examples is looking at the story of the young dragon whose story is very much like Rob Stark's. He was an expert general that was a prodigy at a young age, and he invaded a terror, a place that, you know, against odds that were overwhelming and was able to do a lot of special things, like use goat tracks to get around enemy encampments. And then he was killed at a parley under a peace banner. And he wasn't great at politics, but was great with battles and didn't leave an heir behind and all that. So... And his name is the Young Dragon, and people called Rob Stark the Young Wolf. So there's just a lot of stories. George has woven a lot of stories like that into the into his world. So we uh, that's that's one thing we love to focus on. And but generally, we're just uh, big obsessed Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones folks, and we've been doing it for a long time. Excellent. And, uh, and I would yeah. highly recommend the channel History of Westeros. Uh, there's a link down in the description, uh, and I'm sure the moderators will put one in the chat for people who are watching live. Uh, only have people on here who I would recommend uh, you go and check out their stuff, and I definitely would recommend you go and check out um, History of Westeros. Um, just one, well, just one follow-up to that, I would say. People have been asking, what does your shirt say? Oh, it says, nice watch, brothers. It's the Blues Brothers uh, mashup here. We got John and Sam with the tattoos on their hands there, and uh, yeah, that's very fun. You gotta, you gotta have. I, I like to try to keep um, a new shirt each time. <laughs> There's so many great T-shirts being made in this fandom. It just doesn't end. The mashups and and everything. Absolutely, that, that you're always rocking a good shirt. It has to be said. Um, okay, let's go back to the chat. Um, uh, mother of um, Iro and Visenya says, if we lose the last dragon, do you think that the death of magic, the Night King and dragons, 
causes the seasons to stabilize, or will we not have a flash forward to find out? Well, I'll have a, a first pitch at this and then put it over to you, Aziz. I mean, I think the short answer is I don't think we will, in the show, I don't think we're going to have this you know, 20 years later, everyone going, oh, and I've noticed that the seasons have stabilized now. I don't think we're, <laughs> I don't think we're going to get that kind of thing. So we're not going to have a flash forward to what's going on and, and everybody realizing the full ramifications of it. Um, the Although, the, and the other angle on this one I would take was that although... Um, yes, we're seeing the death of magic in the, the extent of it got ice and fire have both been pushed back. We shouldn't assume that that means all magic is suddenly gone. Uh, Bran is clearly still there, uh, and there's a whole load of other kinds of magic that's that's been going on around the place that isn't ice or fire. So I, although magic, ice and fire magic has been pushed back, that doesn't mean all magic has gone. Uh, but what do you think? Do you uh, do you think that we are going to see the ending of uh, the odd seasons? Well, that's a good question because I agree with you. There's like no way for them to show that unless they do some sort of montage epilogue of the maesters are like, hmm, they're checking the charts and this is uh, puzzling. It's rather regular, isn't it? And but George did say a long time back that we would get a resolution to the seasons. And if they're, if they were going to portray that, I can't imagine how else they would do that. But I don't, but I definitely agree with you that they're, that the end of magic is not necessarily likely uh, a tampering down perhaps, because even in the lowest magic era, when the dragons were, were gone, there was still magic. There was still, that was blood Ravens era. That was the era of Danelle Lothston and these other figures who undoubtedly had some sort of magic going on. And of course, there was magic before the dragons. There was the others came before the dragons did. And there was skin changing before the dragons. And there was other things. It's just that they seem to increase either because of or in in uh, or as they were either a symptom or the cause of, uh, you know, rising magical forces. I see them like kind of like the seasons. They kind of ebb and flow, but maybe over the course of much larger time spans, much, much larger time spans. But yeah, it's good. Whatever, whatever they do with it, I, I agree that the biggest difficulty is how they could possibly portray it. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I think we're in agreement on that one. Um, uh, Three Eyed Monkey says, "Thanks, Robert and Aziz, for a great job on fairly dissecting the show. Thank you. Enjoy the finale and bring on the next book. This is the year. Fingers crossed. Yep, I, I'm, I've been hoping for a while that this was going to be the year. November 2019 was what I've been uh, um, hoping, but he has confirmed he has not finished the books. So uh, <laughs> he's not he's not even started the last one, is what he says. So anyone who's got these." The visions of all the books, or both of them suddenly dropping uh, the moment that the show finishes, that's not going to happen. He's not finished uh, the, the next book, uh, The Winds of Winter, and he's not started. He might, I'm sure he sort of uh, jotted a few things down at least, but he's not started writing the last one. So, yep. However, possibly, if, yeah, you, go. if you follow The Onion, according to The Onion, he is nearly started with The Winds of Winter. He's almost begun. <laughs> 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 I, 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 my fingers are crossed for this year. It's just, it, <laughs> I, I, I'm reading the little hints in here. I probably read too much into it. I shouldn't get too excited. It will happen sometime, guys, and I'm not going to rush <laughs> it. Um, okay, so we've got a couple of questions, one from G. Joe and one from Samuel Toll about uh, Bran and uh, the sort of the Weirwood Network and all of that and what's, what the plan is. So I'll take both of these um both of these together. Uh, so G.J. says Bran has to do something tonight, right? So far, he's just indi been indirectly uh, responsible for the massacre at King's Landing. Um, and then Samuel Toll saying, what about the Weirwoods? Could the children of the forest be manipulating events through Bran, forcing John's lineage to come out in order for Danny to snap, etc.? So uh, I think I'll, I'll put these to, to you together. So sure. Bran clearly has got a plan. And when I'm saying Bran, this is a shortcut way of saying whatever Bran is now, the three-eyed raven, the yeah. amalgamation of memories, whatever it is. Um, Bran clearly has got some design on what happens beyond the, the battle against the army of the dead because he was telling Sam to tell John about um, uh, what 
about his lineage and things like that. And that had no impact on that battle in the North at all. It was purely about what was going to happen afterwards. So he clearly has been, and, and that led indirectly to, uh, to John, uh, first of all, knowing about his, his parentage and then uh, Sansa and then Tyrion and then Barris, And then obviously this played into what happened with uh, Daenerys. So is he manipulating ev events behind the scenes? Is this some great plot? If so, what's going on? What is going on with Bran? It seems, it's, it certainly seems like it's possible. The question we all asked back when Bran very peculiarly told Sam that now's the time to tell John. Right when Sam was angry, the timing was extremely odd. And we all were scratching our heads and trying to come up with answers as to why. And I think the best answer that I heard at the time that you may have heard as well, you may not have agreed it's the best answer, but you probably heard this answer, was that it was a whole death is the, you know, love is the death of duty kind of business. Uh, and or something you know something to relate to the upcoming battle and how john had to be focused on the fighting the night king and not worrying about danny's life but that didn't seem like a strong answer and they never gave any clue that that was ultimately correct so in other words it wasn't fo followed up on at all so <laughs> we're still left with the idea that bran has a reason for this he wanted this to happen he wanted john's parentage to be an issue and or he doesn't want daenerys to sit the throne so one some combination of or all of the above whether or not that means he wants it himself or thinks he's the best person for the job is part of the question but not ultimately uh, you know you don't have to answer one to answer the other whether he wants it for himself whether he's secretly uh, you know, the Night King's touch affected him in some way, whether there's evil or not. That's a side question, because if he thinks he's the best man for the job in a very cold hearted, uh, analytical way, you know, not like, oh, I want it, but uh, I'm the right man for the job because all these humans are, are little children and I'm, you know, the, the know it all Buddha character now. Uh, that's a that's a whole secondary question because it can both be, you know, one doesn't hinge on the other, and I think it's really interesting to wonder a whether he ha whether he truly has any ambition or whether he just thinks he'd be the best man for the job, uh, or if any of this even matters. But if it, none of it matters, then why did Bran why did Bran start messing with it in the first place? That's the question that has to be answered, and uh, if we need an answer to that tonight, yeah, and I think so. Without trying to get too meta on this. I think that the way that they're trying to present how time works is that things that are going to happen were always going to happen. So what Bran is doing is actually just nudging things and playing his part, as it were, in making those things happen. So the Hodor thing, Bran only ever lived in a world where Hodor did hold the door. And so he was just playing his part to make that happen. So when he was manipulating events to create the, the downfall of the Night King, as it were, with the dagger and all the rest of it, that was because he was actually making sure, so Arya needed to have the dagger, so he had to give it to her, um, and all, all that, that kind of thing, that was what he was about. You know, he needed to be in front of the weirwood tree, so he made sure that he was in front of the weirwood tree. So it's almost like he sees what has to happen and then he works in the way in order to get to that. So if we're trying to say, well, why on earth was he uh, trying to get Sam to tell John about his lineage? We actually really can only see it looking backwards. We might be able to say, oh, yeah, so that led to that, led to that. Um, does that make any sense or am I talking completely? It does. Nightmare? And that's why we arrive with this with this unanswered question is why we, we never got, like you said, we ask how we got to this place and it comes back to Bran being uh, Bran telling or, or telling Sam to tell and then it, it all filtering out from there and the rest was predictable like Sansa like Daenerys and Sansa both knew 
what would happen with the secret when it went to certain people. It's not necessarily even magic in a lot of these cases. If when Sansa said, when Danny said Sansa's going to tell, that wasn't magic, and she was a hundred percent right. And when Sansa told Tyrion, she knew it would get to Varys, just like Danny event turned around and said to Tyrion, "Hey, once she told you, she knew you were going to tell Varys." <laughs> yeah and that happened too and none of that was magic either so part of this is human nature and just understanding how information is passed around but also there is absolutely the magic element and um yeah the, the big the, the stumbling block is for people here with bran is why why would he do these things but if there's a satisfactory answer to that it does all make sense but i think the struggle is the why it's the same thing with daenerys people struggle with why did she burn all these people it's partly because they didn't want her to be the care a kind of character that would do that. And I sympathize with that for sure because it was hard for me to watch that. But at the same time, it's it was it does make sense, maybe not in the way they portrayed it, but in the way that she had decided she needed to behave. Uh, yeah, you know what I mean. And I think that the why for me at the least with Bran is that he is wanting the end of the threats of ice and fire. And so what he was doing in the North with the Army of the Dead was to try and end that threat. And I think the why, at the least in the South, is to try and end the threat of the dragons and Daenerys. Because mm -hmm. we've, if we think about these two forces against each other of ice and fire, both able to destroy the world, if we take Bran, the Three-Eyed Raven, in the middle of this, trying to stop both forces, I think that that kind of makes sense. So, mm. uh, and, and we have to remember the Weirwood Network, which he represents. Yes, they do not want to have the ice destroying the world, but the, the original threat to them was fire. This was what the first men were doing, burning down the Weirwood trees. Yeah. So fire is also not something that the Weirwood Network would wish to uh, allow to be going running free reign uh, everywhere that's not a thing that they would like so at the least that seems to be as planned the question for me is whether or not there's another level to this whether or not they think that they as we've been discussing they can be making a power grab here somehow that's a good way to think about it is that he's not against Daenerys so much as that he is against the dragons that's a good yeah. way to think about it yeah or at least a way to think uh, a good way to consider thinking about it yeah, well, as we're we're getting a lot of questions about Bran, so we're, we're, let's do another one. Um, Gavin uh, Mackey says it seems like all the talk of Bran being king ignores what a disaster Bloodraven was, even as Hand. Do you think he would be much different? So, I mean, I think there's a couple of things there. Whether you, first of all, do you think Bloodraven was a disaster as Hand of the King, and secondly, what do you think Bran would be as ruler? Well, I love that question because I think that's part of uh, the evidence for Bran becoming king here is that the person who ran the last great council 70 some years before the start of the books was in fact Bloodraven. So <laughs> that's yeah. all very, very interesting. And you ended up with Aegon the unlikely on the throne uh, certainly would be unlikely for Bran to sit the throne <laughs> at this point uh, for a number of reasons and he traveled around Bran uh, noticed that Aegon the unlikely traveled around uh, traipsed around the country with a very large man um, yeah uh, <laughs> he didn't ride on his back or anything but you know that's kind of that's kind of loose a loose parallel, but it's something. <laughs> uh, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't think Bloodraven was a disaster as hand. He was certainly controversial. He, I, I don't think he was great, but he was uh, effective in a lot of ways. Uh, he was too harsh, I think. Um, he did overfocus on the Blackfires. And, but it is also interesting that he executed someone during the Great Council. And I wonder, uh, I kind of doubt that would happen in this scenario on TV, but it's interesting, something to consider for the books, maybe if there's any sort of precedent like that. So it's really interesting that the guy that uh, ran the last great council went north to become the Three-Eyed Raven and then tutored Bran. And now here we are talking about how Bran might, could ascend to an even higher seat. So yeah, it's still full of, it still really feels crackpotty, but the more I toss the idea around, the more 
it makes the more it doesn't necessarily make sense. It's just less crackpot, you know. <laughs> yeah, put it that way. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I th I think it makes more sense to me uh, thematically. Bran yeah. being uh, the leader, sort of representing the the memories of Westeros, that kind of makes sense more than actually. Let's figure out whether Bran would be a good king. I think that doesn't work for me. I don't, on a day to day working through the nitty gritty of business, no, that doesn't. Um, first chapter, so, first chapter. There's that. He's got that going for him, and he's also got the uh, the whole the whole nefarious third twist that. Dan and Dave were surprised by the George told them there's you know. uh, yeah I mean I think the third <laughs> twist I, I'm I'm reckoning that is and this is picking up on Angie C's question saying thank you so much for your videos do you think John might kill kill Danny I think that's the third twist uh, okay. is it's just and for those who don't know what we mean when we say the third twist uh, the showrunners uh, said that when they uh, had their sort of big conversation with George, or one of their big conversations with George R. R. Martin. He told them what was coming up. There were three moments, three big twists uh, that just like they just went wow uh, at and uh, were caught by surprise about. The the two we know about were Shireen and Hodor, uh, both of which will happen in the books, probably not in exactly the same way, uh, but they will happen. And then it'll the, be reversed. Uh, Shireen will hold the door. And Hodor <laughs> will be burned. <laughs> Just trying to work out what Shireen might be short for. Uh, I'm not, not going to go there. Uh, but, but they will they will happen in the books. And there is one other thing which will happen in the books that they are going to put in the show. I've not heard anyone say that it's, it's what Danny did to King's Landing or anything like that. So the implication is that this is something that's going to happen in this last episode. Um, I think... It's probably John killing Daenerys because that is just uh, uh, until this last moment, the idea that he might do something like that is just ridiculous. But now you can just about imagine why he might if he sees what she's done. Uh, so, yeah, I think that that is the kind of twist that would work as a wow WTF moment. It would be. Um, anime lover Nicole, thank you very much, uh, saying, I want either a council ruling or the seven kingdoms becoming their own kingdoms again. Could that happen? Uh, I'm going to throw this to you, Aziz. I'm also just, uh, the uh, for anyone who's going to Con of Thrones, they've now released the schedules and uh, all these questions about how um, Westeros will be ruled. Actually, I've got a panel on there, uh, and Aziz is going to be on it, as well as another couple of excellent people, uh, and is going to be covering this very issue uh, called How to Govern Westeros. So if you're going to Con of Thrones and you're interested in that, do come along to that. But what do you reckon, Aziz, in terms of a council ruling, or perhaps the Seven Kingdoms sort of splitting up? I don't know that splitting up is necessarily better, but it's better than you know, a lot of other things. It's It's the monarchy system isn't great, but having seven monarchies isn't necessarily better. Uh, so some, they've certainly foreshadowed in a lot of different ways, having a uh, changing the government or at least acknowledging that what they've been doing hasn't worked that well, uh, or it's had mixed results. It's been up and down. Certainly there've been good Kings, uh, but there's also been a lot of really bad ones. And, Maybe it had been a while before there had been a really good one. Aegon the Unlikely was probably the last good one, but even he was not popular with the Great Lords. So, yeah, uh, you know, they talk about the whole breaking the wheel and Tyrion talking about d different options and different problems and different in history and all that. So, yeah, I think that uh, some sort of change in government would be a great idea monarchy isn't ideal but splitting into seven kingdoms isn't ideal either uh so they would have to come up with some sort of centralized system that's more representative and not uh, autocratic uh not not as subject to tyranny maybe something like um yeah, maybe something like uh, they need their own Magna Carta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that would make a whole lot of sense. I think I would go with what are the things that I don't think will happen. We're not going to have a full democracy because that's just it wouldn't work in the system. 
we're not going to have, I think we're not going to have the Iron Throne still there. So that symbol is going to have gone. Um, I think I think probably breaking down into, into seven kingdoms or nine kingdoms or however many they would need to do, that I would agree with you, that wouldn't solve the problem. It just creates smaller kingdoms. So uh, I like the idea of there being a council. Um, I like the idea of there being like uh, a council with like one person who's the nominal king. Uh, so that kind of works for me. But yeah, they probably will end up with a king or queen at the end of it, um, simply because that will show that they uh, uh, there is a winner, and they seem to they seem to like the idea that there might be a winner in all of this. Maybe they should adopt the Dothraki system. That seems very. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, nah, just kidding. <laughs> no, no, we're not going to go. We're not going to go there. I, I mean, I would, I would love a two-hour-long episode where they're just discussing what the best way of governing the country might be. But I, I think most people find that a little bit dull. A um, giant melee for the throne. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Uh, Ryan Ortego says, "Love your content. I watch every new video. Thank you so much." Broken Birds says, "And now our watch is ending. Love from Las Vegas. Thank you very much." All right. Um, and Richard Seymour says, uh, I think in the end, John stays committed to being honest. George R. R. Martin will side with some sort of moral code. Uh, season one, episode one emphasized this. So um, perhaps we can talk about this a little bit more. This, so this idea that John is going to be faced with uh, some kind of moral dilemma about whether... Uh, whether to go along with Daenerys, whether to kill her, whether to lie to her about whether he still supports, because she will want some kind of oath of fealty from him in some way, I'm yeah. sure of that. Do you think that John, who has, been, has, has always been set up as this spiritual successor almost to Ned, do you think that that makes him more or less likely to tell the truth uh, or do you think it, or or lie? Wh which way do you think the fact that he is set up as this as Ned's kind of successor makes it more likely to? Which way do you think he's going to go? Basically, I think that he's going to at first have to go accept it, and then maybe he'll snap when he sees some of the consequences or the the pending consequences. Maybe not unlike what what I said before about s uh, when other people start to face. Uh, are threatened with execution or punishment that he can't bear that. And I do think there is some threat to him as well. I don't know that she'll kill him. He hasn't been, he hasn't committed treason, uh, though she could kill him just because he's got a competing claim. And because uh, she can't have him leave. That's the thing. Like the standard here for a medieval style ruler, where someone has a competing claim, you don't just go let them go home. You have to keep them around to make sure they don't go uh, try to run off and claim the throne. You can't let them go ga gather power out somewhere else. So he would have to stay and he's not going to like that either. That he would accept. I think that's the kind of thing that conflict that I think he would be okay. Well, if this is what the realm needs, I'll stay. Uh but once it starts to threaten people he loves, that's maybe would be his turning point. Um, but I do think ultimately he'll he'll not he'll he'll have a turning point at some point. I, th I think he will. I think he will turn on Daenerys, and if the only way for him to do that is to lie to her, then I think that he will take that option. I have to say. Yeah. Um, uh, anime lover Nicole saying Bran saw the dragon in a vision so he knew that King's Landing would fall. Yeah, we covered that a little bit earlier. I think that that is the clear implication. So that that image that we had of uh, a shadow of a dragon of Drogon flying over King's Landing that Bran had a couple of seasons ago in his visions, that I think was information we that he knew that all of that was going to happen. So he was just pushing things into the right direction. Um, uh, in order to make that happen. And uh, M. Smith 2003 said, did Bran know Danny was going to burn King's Landing? Why didn't he stop all that carnage? He's partly responsible then. So I think the, the this all adds up to the idea that Bran, it, he's using people and he's manipulating people. And yes, I think he did know. I'll ask Aziz in a moment whether you, know, whether you think 
he also knew. I think he is complicit in this and he allowed it to happen because he could see the chain of events that logically after this, people are then going to stop Daenerys. Until that point, John was absolutely behind Daenerys and everything, and all the others, uh, Tyrion was, I uh, didn't particularly like her, but wasn't about to try and stop her in any way. So I think Bran saw the future, saw what Daenerys did and thought, well, that's the way that they turn on her, uh, which makes him a very dark character, but I think that's the implication. Do you, do you also hold with that interpretation? It makes a lot of sense, and it comes back to what we said about Blood Raven and how Blood Raven is Bran's mentor, because Blood Raven was very ruthless. He was a means justify the ends kind of guy for sure. And if he had to break a few eggs or a few eggons along the way, then so be it. And he was willing to accept that. Uh, that's why he would do things like. La, uh, tell Aenys Blackfire, sure, come on over, make your case, and then cut his head off. Or that's why he would uh, call for extreme punishment on on rebels, and uh, to the point that even Tywin Lannister uh, would disagree. Not obviously not to his face; they they were uh, contemporaries. But the same policy that Tywin Lannister thought was too harsh was something Blood Raven ad advocated for on a regular basis. Uh, so you have a lot. Uh, and you have a lot of you have a lot of uh, parallels there with the way Blood Raven managed himself as Hand of the King and Master Whispers very ruthlessly and very bottom line, and uh, that fits with this idea that Bran is manipulating things in order to accomplish some sort of goal that he thinks is uh, noble, and it really fits with a meta theme that's played out between Blood Raven and Bitter Steel. So long ago, you have these competing. Uh, pieces on the board that were at war with each other in life. And those pieces are still playing out. Blood, Bittersteel's legacy is still in play uh, with the Golden Company and the Blackfire still trying to claim the throne. And that's still, uh, and Blood Raven is still alive, um, manipulating events in, in his way uh, that affect the, the outcome of the Iron Throne. So that's very meta. That's very off the beaten path, but it just goes to show you how these themes are duplicated and ex and portrayed in so many different ways in the books uh, that the show is, uh, doesn't have time for. And I, and I understand that it doesn't have time for all those things, so. <laughs> yeah, and this this actually, so Sarah McLaren has, uh, has asked a very um, deep question along these lines saying, if the astrolabe in the credit, credits represents the circular nature of history, does it suggest that both the past and the future are fixed? Bran influences by his point of observation, quantum physics, question mark. So, I mean, I think we've been talking around mm. this for a while. What I, I will throw in, and Aziz, perhaps you've got some other thoughts perhaps on the astrolabe here as well. What I'll throw in is that uh, the when I say that this, it's the time seems to operate on a fixed loop system, as far as we can tell. The simplest example is when Bran goes back to the Tower of Joy and he calls out to Ned, Ned turns around, um, Ned always turned around. That was a thing that always happened. It was just that Bran had to go back to make it happen. With Hodor, it gets a lot more complicated, but Hodor always was going to hold the door because all through Bran's life, he was saying Hodor because in his youth, the incident had happened. And the incident mm. happened because Bran went back there. So he created this closed loop. So the future was fixed by what Bran did in the past. And this plays out across the, the sort of the way that I interpret what's going on is that when Bran is now influencing events in what we would consider to be the present, that's because he sees what has happened in the future. And he is actually just teeing that up in order for that to be what always was going to happen. Uh, it's a little bit mind swirly, uh, but that, <laughs> that's certainly the way that I interpret this. Is there anything just to sort of to answer the question there? Is there anything in terms of the astrolabe, the the, the swirly thing that appears in the uh, the title credits? Is there anything there that you think sort of gives us any hints as to how how this is all fitting together? Well, that is tricky in that sense. The like you said, the time travel stuff is you never 
that's just always like uh, i don't know how wait does he yeah it just it's it's it never quite works exactly yet you can also see how it could uh so i hope they don't make too much of that but it does it is true that he doesn't seem to be making large moves that uh you know large scale moves that seem to have uh, large effects it's more like he drops a pebble in the pond and the ripples you know cut across the surface and have large effects in that sense you know like uh small moving like the, the the butterfly wings causing a hurricane in china that kind of that concept the whole chaos theory business small moves creating large effects and that does make sense for a master manipulator with information with so much information at his fingertips and given that we don't exactly know what information he has at his fingertips it's interesting to well there's a lot of ways they could play with that as writers as as uh tv show makers and the best way is for it to be as subtle as possible without it being too unrealistic. And eh, I guess that's what they've done. You know, people have been what really the problem is people have been complaining that Bran hasn't done enough. And well, maybe they'll be shocked at, well, he has been doing quite a lot, actually. Or we'll just be saying, yeah, he didn't do much, did he? <laughs> we'll, we'll just have to see how this episode goes. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, I I think we just have to see in terms of how the showrunners are going to deal with it. I think we'll get a lot clearer in the books, but I think in terms of how the show are going to do it, um, uh, I, they probably will just leave it vague, to be honest. Uh, Kristen Dale and uh, Graham W. Johnson, thank you so much for your super chats. I didn't see any questions attached to them, uh, but my uh, moderators will let me know if they pick up on them. Um, got a question here from Susan Dunkel, one of my patrons. Um, and actually, I'll take this as a moment to say, patrons, thank you. I always say this. Uh, I cannot do this without you. Uh, your support is what allows me to dedicate the time to create the videos that I do and things like that. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. That's why on my Thursday live streams, I give my patrons priority access on asking questions. Uh, so if you're at all interested in supporting the channel, or if you want to get access to things like priority questions on my live streams or the uh, audio narrations that I do, exclusive stuff for my patrons, please do check out the link to my Patreon page. It will be down in the description. I'm sure the moderators will put something over in the uh, chat as well. But Susan says, uh, thank you for all that you do. You're very welcome. I've enjoyed this community as much as the show, if not more. Yeah, it's a fantastic community. Do you have any thoughts on who the original potentially thousands of year old three-eyed raven might be. So uh, I think this is one of those questions and, and Aziz is exactly the man with his history of Westeros hat on to answer this. I think <laughs> this is probably one of the, uh, the, the, the questions where it gets a little bit confused between the three-eyed raven and the three-eyed crow in the books. The three-eyed crow appears to be um basically the the avatar blood raven's avatar in the kind of the spiritual realm or whatever it is we we call it um that is what bran is searching for is this image of a three-eyed crow and the blood raven kind of goes oh yeah that that story checks out that sounds like that could be what i appear like uh rather than it being a particular title but right. uh, do you want to have a sort of a go at this? How, how do you think this translates across the show? Because Bran very clearly talks about being in this line of three-eyed ravens. Yeah, they, it's definitely a pretty distinct difference from book to show. In the books, as you say, it's not really a title. It's just what Bran calls this thing he sees in his dreams. He doesn't have a name for it. And so he's like, hey, that thing, it's a raven or it's a crow with three eyes. So I call it the three-eyed crow. Uh, you know, he didn't want to call it Bob or Charlie or something. And it's just like cold hands. Cold hands is not cold hands' his name. He doesn't say, hey, guys, I'm cold hands. He doesn't say anything. They just call him cold hands. They give him a nickname. They call him cold hands because they want to call him something. And it's the, so it's the same concept. It's just a nickname given to a thing that has no name. And when they meet him, he's he's conf slightly confused. Like you said, they're like, oh, yeah, that's that's me, basically. And then the appendix clarifies very clearly that that is who he is. This is the three eyed crow blood, you know, Brendan Rivers, very clearly in the appendix. And uh, but it's not a it's not a title. They've sort of made brand. They've sort of taken the concept of brand slash 
Blood Raven as the last Green Seer and made that the title and the concept that's in the show, where it's this human representative of the Werewood Network. And the way they seem to be portraying it on the show, there can only ever be one at a time, which is not the case in the books that we know of. Certainly doesn't seem that way because from what we're told, there used to be plenty of Green Seers, maybe not running around, but around. And that was a thing of the past and they dwindled down severely. And now it may be sort of a mantle in a sense that's passed down. Uh, you know, we wonder, Blood Raven himself, he vanished on a ranging at age 77 beyond the wall. And well, what happened there? Was he, did he get the call? Did some three-eyed raven of, of in his dreams, you know, summon him in a similar way? Or was it uh, a different set of circumstances? I guess it was at least somewhat differently because in Brand's case, there was a sense of urgency. There's the, the others are upon them. Whereas in Blood Raven's time, the urgency may have been something in a, for a future generation, something to prepare for, but not quite as imminent. Uh, on the other hand, time is very fluid to the Werewood Network, and uh, we don't necessarily want to think about it in human terms. <laughs> but that's getting super meta. We don't need to go there. We've already gotten confused with this Hodor business being circular. Yeah. So, But and yeah, so like, go ahead. Don't. So basically, try to wrap that up. It doesn't seem that there are, not only is there not a Night King in the books to be targeting this specific last green seer over and over, it isn't some cycle that's played out over and over where many Night Kings have tried to kill many last green seers. That is not really a thing. And we, for all we know, it doesn't seem that there have been multiple attempts to kill the, the last green seer in the books. It seems like the others have been gone for a long time. And there isn't any in between that. There isn't any behind the scenes. Maybe the others awoke for a couple of days and tried to sneak up on the last green seer. None of that. So it's 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 extremely different when you get deep into the lore like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, all I was going to add to that, I think that's excellent. Thank you. Uh, all I was going to add to that was I see the chat have been uh, coming out with uh, uh, probably the best explanation of this, which is of course from Doctor Who, which is that people assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect. But actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. And I think <laughs> that uh, that uh, tells us all we need to know about how time operates. We also yeah. had, oh, <laughs> we, we also had, as we're doing, uh, crossing, uh, crossing fandoms, LML was in the chat. Uh, hi, LML. Um, hi, LML. Two of his usual uh, $6.66 mm -hmm. um, um, super chats uh, with... We're an anarcho syndicist commune. We take turns <laughs> acting as a sort of execute officer of the week, but all the decisions of that officer must be ratified by a simple majority in case of purely internal affairs and a two thirds majority in the case of dot, dot, dot. So, uh, for those who don't know, feel free to Google it. That is probably the funniest film in the entire world. Um, uh, let's go with. Um, Chadcast saying uh, the Dothraki will defect, they are not city people. Northern elements of the army will ally with the Starks. The Mad Queen retains power with Drogon as king. Um, okay, so what do you what do you think about that? Do, what what do you think will happen with the Dothraki? It's a it's a the kind of it's a kind of a curious question because I really deeply hope that they don't just hand wave the Dothraki and the Unsullied. Of course they can't. I hope if Daenerys dies, well, this army that's hyper loyal to her is all of a sudden, you know, unrooted and has no obvious place to go or way to get there. Uh, you need like Yara to come over with the iron fleet and ferry them over to the basket of the Dothraki sea or something. It's a strange problem that the show has because they've consistently just not dealt with the Thraki logistical issues, but this is as big as they could possibly have a logistical issue with other than, you know, how do we get them to Westeros in the first place? So I think that's an important thing. The kind of thing that will be a major consideration in the books. If so anything like this happens at all, any kind of, remove Daenerys conspiracy is going to have to take into account the Unsullied and Dothraki and how dangerous they are. And you can't just ignore that. So if, if you see, if, if it's like you say, where the armies, many different lords from around Westeros gather and bring armies with them, well, they could significantly outnumber the Unsullied and Dothraki. And there's, there's always that. There's always a chance that they're just offered 
you know, here, we'll let y'all go back to. But where do the Unsullied go back to? The Dothraki, they have a place to go back to. Where do the Unsullied go? What do they do? Where do... There's no home for them. There's no. Someone would. There's certainly several lords who'd be like, yeah, I would love to have that army. I'll hire them. So. But I, I really don't know how. It's, it's the kind of question that the show sometimes, if not often, dodges logistical issues. Yeah. I, th so. I think I, I mean, I think I'd agree that I think they probably will dodge it. I think that if Daenerys does die, there is no place for them on Westeros is, is where I would say. And I yeah. think probably the same thing goes for the Unsullied. The whole reason why they are there is because they uh, are following Daenerys. Now, technically, they are all her blood riders. And what that means that technically they should now then all go off and try and kill whoever it was who killed her. Um, uh, Good point. And then, <laughs> so I, I suspect that this is the kind of thing that they will gloss over. Um, but yeah, there's, I don't think there's a place for them in, in Westeros. Um, had a couple of, uh, thank you to my uh, moderators, got pulled a couple of things in the chat to my attention. Um, Soul Reaper Q8 was saying, what are your plans after the show is over? Are you interested in covering something other than Game of Thrones? Any other fantasy series? Uh, yeah, I'm getting asked this a lot, so I'm very happy to answer it. Um, I will carry on covering the books. Uh, as we said, fingers crossed, the book might come out uh, at some point this year, maybe next year, but hopefully soon, uh, the winds of winter. So I'm going to carry on covering the books. There's obviously the spin-off uh, there. As I understand it, rumors are that they're filming the pilot as we speak, so that could happen at some point next year. Uh, I'm also looking to get more into Tolkien and the world of Lord of the Rings. There is the TV show, which is probably going to happen in a couple of years' time, but I love exploring the world and the, 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 the works that are there already. So I'm going to get into that a little bit more. And then there's a few other random things. I did Westworld last year. Um, I, I will definitely be doing Westworld again when season three happens. And there are a few other things that I like uh, that I may pick up on. Stuff like The Witch is going to be a TV series, uh, Black Mirror I'm a big fan of. So those kinds of things. And there's also my second channel, for those who don't know. Um, I, I love classic science fiction and fantasy. If that's your thing as well, and if you like audiobooks, my second channel is called The Well-Told Tale, and that is literally me reading the finest science fiction and fantasy stories that I can get my hands on. Uh, things like at the moment we're doing The Time Machine, we've done Call of Cthulhu, um, we've done Frankenstein. So if, if you're at all interested in that, please do go check that out. Um, and the second thing was uh, Butter Tank says, please tell Robert that the key is the second coming by Yates. Uh, now, this, this is the kind of thing which always puts me on the spot when I, I'm trying to remember um aziz are you are you a yates but so this is a for those who don't know this is this will be wb yates who was a poet um back in i think the 19th century um uh and i'm struggling to remember what that exact poem was about but aziz are you a poetry man afraid not i did know the name of the author and that is about it <laughs> uh okay i mean i think no, I'm not even going to guess because, guys, I, I would just be into speculation. But, uh, guys, the um, what I always find is that there are cleverer people than me in the chat. So there will be somebody out there who's who's excellent, who can uh, try and give us some sort of a summary or something. And uh, I will happily have a look at that. And uh, perhaps the moderators can pick it up and let me know. Um, let's go and uh, see whether we've got a few more questions to come on. Uh, my lady foot doctor says, will Danny be cut this year? I know this is a great name. Will Danny be cut by the throne uh, like Queen Rhaenyra? So being cut by the Iron Throne is quite an interesting thing. Uh, again, we shall pick Aziz's brains, but there are a number of monarchs who have been cut by the Iron Throne. And there's a sort of an implication that this might be some sort of moral judgment on them in some way. Um, but the question here assumes that Danny will sit on the Iron Throne. I don't think that that's a hundred percent at all. But do you, first of all, could you just give us a, a an overview of what the being cut by the Iron Throne thing is, and whether or not you think that Danny might therefore be cut? 
Well, I think the Iron Throne as a symbol is a really, really deep and interesting topic. And I think that the way it's portrayed is the opposite of the way it's intended to be seen as a symbol. In other words, the way the characters react to it in the story is the opposite is the way that we readers are supposed to see it. So to use this example, uh, she's cut. Rhaenyra was cut on the throne. Well, first of all, there's some lo lo logical problems to the story of her being cut on the throne. She sits down on the throne immediately after taking it. In one sentence, Septon Eustace says that she's wearing armor. Uh, yet, then how so how is she cut on the throne if she's wearing armor it doesn't really make a lot of sense on the uh, but i think this is the wrong question to ask in the first place it's not that the throne cuts those who are unworthy of it it's that the throne is on it's just that deadly and dangerous it is bloody it anyone who sits on it is you know ruined by its power and its bloodiness just like the going back to the one ring as an example you can't wield it the way you intend to wield it. Galadriel knew that she wanted to wield it for good, but she also knew that she would be corrupted by it. She would, her intent would be corrupted. And it's the same message here. If you, you try to wield this throne for good, it's just going to cut you. It's just, you know, it's that whole sword without a hilt uh, analogy from Melisandre, sorcery, or not from Melisandre, from Makoro, not Makoro. Uh, what's his face? The maester, uh, Marwyn. Sorcery Marwyn. is a sword without a hilt. That, that whole thing. So, uh, you, it, it, there's all these great analogies for power that that's too much for one person to, to hold or for any man to, or woman to hold. And I think that's the message of the Iron Throne, not that certain people are worthy or not. It's that the, the thing itself is unworthy and monstrous and, and bloody and corrupting and evil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. And I've just been having a quick check in on the chat. Um, I knew that that there was always going to be like as as a, with all poems you remember like one random line uh things fall apart the center cannot hold is from this uh natalie e comes out with turning and turning in the widening gaia or gaia i'm not quite gaia. sure that's how you pronounce it the falcon mm -hmm. cannot hear the falconer things fall apart the center cannot hold mere anarchy is loosed upon the world the blood dimmed tide is loosed so um nice. yeah it's uh, themes of anarchy and uh, and death and destruction uh and uh, I just happened to notice the thing, but in Ines Cruz says, uh, Aziz's sofa is larger than my bedroom. So there you go. You've got some sofa envy going on there. <laughs> sofa uh, envy. That's a new one. <laughs> uh, okay. Let's, um, let's go back to the few of these super chats. We're getting a little bit behind. Um, uh, Ariel Rios says, seeing how things played out last episode, what do you think the bittersweet ending would be? Sorry, late to this live stream, so I don't know if you've already answered it. I think we've covered the bittersweet thing quite well. I'll just sort of broadly, um, well, I don't know whether we've covered it well, we've, we've certainly covered it at length. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I, for, for me, it's the uh, looking at the, the sweetness of it, the good things are the fact that both the destructive force of ice and the destructive force of fire will be pushed back. This, this is a good thing. This will save humanity from destruction from both of them. However, this has come at great loss. That is the overarching bittersweet thing for me. And then we get different people's storylines, each of which may have an element of that. So that's where I'm, I'm at on the bittersweet thing. Um, uh, Real Chunka says, John as king meets all Danny's reasons for wanting the throne. She never considers it. She gets a pass for this, but he's crucified for refusing to lie. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm not, I, I'm not entirely sure. What, I don't think there's a question there, but uh, yeah, so. It's he's, a dire he's, prediction. <laughs> I, I, I reckon so, yeah. Um, uh, Kristen Dale, uh, I think I already said thank you for your super chat. Um, uh, my lady foot doctor with another question um, uh, says, does Theon have an heir? Uh, what about the captain's daughter? Yes. Yeah, so I think that whether he does or not is a, uh, is actually not really in terms of who rules the Iron Islands, because I think the clear implication is that Yara now does. Uh, so she's now ruling the Iron Islands. So whether or not Theon has an heir, I think isn't really the, the point there. Um, but, it's a uh, moot point. Oh, 
<laughs> I, did, I did when I was tweeting this out. I did did say that we'd probably get some puns from Aziz. So um, <laughs> they, there you go. Good not to disappoint. Um, Great on twenty seven says, "Do you think Mira Reed will show up tonight?" Well, yeah, that's another one we were trying to think a while earlier about who might be summoned down to King's Landing to because there are two people who've been writing out potentially Varys was writing out to a load of people and then Daenerys might be requiring people to come and pay fealty so we might see a lot of the the noble lords and ladies of the land coming down um Mira Reed, Reed is one that we've not thought about um she is heavily hinted to the heir to Greywater Watch um, I will hmm. just say that this is the last chance we have for Howland Reed. I'm just going to leave it out there. Um, I don't <laughs> want to get my hopes up. But if yeah, if they're calling yeah. the Lords, then he is the Lord of Greywater Watch. It's his chance. Um, yeah, it's a small chance, that's. <laughs> uh, Christina Dyer, what happened with Benjamin Stark's character? He is still alive beyond the wall. What part do you think the crypts at Winterfell will have tonight? Um, right, so my take on this is the crypts at Winterfell, we're done with them now. I think that that's, that's it. Benjamin Stark, I think we're done with him as well. I think he's dead. But is there anything uh, you'd want to add on that? I, no, I think those whites ripped him apart, unfortunately. Poor Uncle Benjamin. He's uh he he uh he's gone. I think he's gone. I yeah, I think I would agree with that. Um Lauren's Corner saying hello, sweetie. Hi, here's to all your good work. Thank you very much. Lauren is of course a a poet herself and her channel, so perhaps we'll have the answer on Yates. Um <laughs> so Michelle Kalen saying, oops, forgot to send the thank you bugs. Well, thank you. Any chance the old town or high towers or the maesters will show up in the Great Council or maybe relocate to the South Ron Court. So, yeah, we were talking about this possibly in a, uh, also in terms of the who might uh, emerge, whether we get like Archmaster Ebros. Do you think, um, just sort of taking that slightly more broadly, Aziz, do you think that uh, we're going to see anything else from uh, the Maesters in this or Possibly the faceless men as these kind of like other groups on the outside. Are, are we going to see more, or is it just going to be focusing on the characters that we really know in a central? I think that there's a good opportunity for them to, you know, in a in a finale setting to have all the remaining characters, a lot of loose ends tied up like that. Then, and we did talk about that a little earlier. About that would be the best way we could think of to get the archmasters involved to be to have a great council, which they would definitely be involved in you would think uh citing precedent and you know being being stuffy and you know being the way they are being academic and all that they're fun <laughs> I, I hope so i think it would make sense to I, I doubt they would have much of a role a couple of lines just to, um maybe something like picel starts to talk and they cut him off you know how like that happened when uh Ty, he was getting ready to announce the duel and tywin just is like Stand aside, sir. We've only got a few minutes here. It's like the same thing. We've only got one episode left. We don't have time for you. <laughs> but we want to acknowledge that you exist. So, <laughs> uh, Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think that kind of makes sense. It kind of fits in with uh, with how Bran seems to operate with them. We've not got time for this. Uh, I mean, I still loved his, uh, his greeting when Daenerys arrived and he just sort of said, oh, by the way, the, your, your dragon's just been reincarnated as a zombie. Um, uh, we haven't got time for any more discussion. Let's move on. And it was just yeah. like, well, okay, that's, uh, that's uh, very much uh, straight to the point. And it kind of <laughs> He's worked. like, seriously, when ice and fire come together, zombie dragons is what happens. Y'all really need to get this under control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. And, and we've had a, a Mark Croft requesting hot pie. Uh, I, I'd, I'd love hot pie to make a return. I suspect he probably won't, though. Um, Jamie Andreasen says, do you know if George R. R. Martin ever considered an animated adaptation of A Song of Ice and Fire? Considering all the advantages that come with animation when the books are finished, is that something you'd like to see? Um, for me, yeah, I mean, I would. I think, though, at the moment, they're going to leave this as kind of the definitive version, certainly until he gets the books out. Um, I imagine that that's probably was part of the contract that he signed with them, was that they had exclusive rights to be uh, adapting A Song of Ice and Fire for 
um, uh, for TV um, until such and such a point. So I imagine that that's what's going on there. Um, but what do you what do you reckon, Aziz? Is, is there any chance of us having a sort of a, a more um, animated adaptation, or or would you want one? I think it's possible, and sure, why not? I don't know why. I don't. I don't. I don't. I, I wouldn't be against something like that. I don't think it could be bad. Um, it would allow them to use more characters. It would allow them to take more time because you have you don't have to worry about actor aging and contract quite as much. You get voice work is a little a lot easier to manage. And of course, the huge challenges with sets and things like, well, dire wolves uh, would be manageable. But on the other hand, you still would be faced with a lot of the same problems, which is that a lot of the story is internal and character driven from, a, uh, from the POV style that you just can't ever capture on TV. Uh, but that's a limitation of the medium that's always going to be in place. So I don't think that's an, an argument against doing it. It's just an acknowledgement of where its shortcomings are. But you still can have amazing vocal performances and acting. Uh, you know, you lose, you know, things like the great facial uh, acting of, of Jamie and Theon and Cersei and all those characters. But you, you make up for it in other ways by getting to tell more of the story. So I would love to see it. Yeah, I think, uh, I think I, I've heard nothing about it happening, but I've we've talked about it before as something that could happen. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's up to George. It's just to be somebody with the somebody you who's know, a large scale studio or somebody like that would have to approach him and, and pitch it. And I think they'd have to get HBO's permission as well. So a lot of legal hurdles to get around as well. But but it could be done. I hope so. You know, it's a long time. It's a big enough, uh, powerful enough property that uh, further adaptations are 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 lucrative so there's optimism reason for optimism i think yeah absolutely um i had a i spotted something in the chat that i thought was a, a really good question um brenda dotter saying do you think daenerys might reveal being pregnant giving john yet another conundrum after all after all he revealed several times that he would never father a bastard now this is i mean i think this is a really good question because the there were some people i know who were absolutely convinced that Daenerys being pregnant was going to be a key part of this season because last season they played up again and again the the fact that she didn't have children and John queried why she thought she wasn't going to be able to have children and all the rest of it. Uh, so do you think that that is, uh, clearly we've only got one episode left and so the only thing that really could happen now is for her to reveal that she's pregnant and then leave John with this conundrum if he does kill her and all the rest of it. Do you think that we are going to see something along those lines or have they just ignored this sort of, it wasn't really even a plot line, it's sort of the hints that they set out? It, it might have been a way to tease uh, you know, it's such a natural idea that, oh, well, she could get pregnant. They're having sex. That's the thing that happens. But yeah, it, it would absolutely add more conflict for John. Um, it would be a little weird, the timing of it, but the, you know, that's not to, to put, I wouldn't put it past them. Uh, I kind of guess I'm kind of guessing no, but it, it would, you could see how it would make things harder for John and how, having if he has to do if he has to kill her how it would be such a horrible traumatic thing for him to have to go through how he would be again to make another lord of the rings reference he would be like frodo just severely damaged inside and not able to be a normal person living in normal society anymore and he would have to go sail beyond in this case he would maybe go beyond the wall and go go hang out with torment and, and ghost and He's at least lived with them before. It wouldn't be, you know, it's at least something he's got experience doing. Uh, and he could keep them from writing the Seven Kingdoms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. So I've got a. Um, I, th I think I. I think I'd agree, and I think that. Yeah, the only way that this is going to come up is if she mentions it just before he kills her in some kind of a, a tragic way that he's got. Well, oh, and I've now killed my unborn child as well. Um, it's, yeah, it, it, it would be horrible, but it's possible. Now, um, uh, Jojo Lady Dane has helpfully sent me the poem that people were talking about. All right. Um, so um, apparently just the background to this um, is that it's in the Spotify playlist that the showrunners published saying that the ending was covered in it. Uh, and it's included in the song Can't Stop the Bleeding by Morello. So... Um, 
it doesn't look too long, so I'll just have a quick read through it, guys. Uh, if you're ready. Uh, so this is called uh, The Second Coming by W.B. Yeats. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Oh, Blood-dimmed <laughs> tide is loosed and everywhere. The ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming, hardly are those words out, when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight, somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs, while all about it is real, all about it, real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again. But now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. So there you have it. Mm. That sounds mm. like no Iron Throne and seven kingdoms or nine kingdoms and... Uh a return to you know petty or petty struggles a different kind of struggle but similar yeah which is by the way consistent with what how the end of the long night is described in the world of ice and fire in in the east is uh <clears throat> the kingdom's return to you know there was no after uniting to face the darkness and defeating it they return to the petty squabbling and the different tribes of men went their separate directions uh you know you know there was still a lot there was fear and murder and all this it wasn't it wasn't good so which doesn't really sound bittersweet that's just bitter <laughs> yeah i mean as i was just re reading through it and it's just it's not uh there aren't many happy words there are there no um, uh, no yeah. It's, it's just about, bitter, bitter. No, there's no. It's, <laughs> yeah. So this is <laughs> about. I mean, I, I think perhaps if if anything, it's this is bitter, bitter. But it's called the second <laughs> coming. So the hint is that uh, this rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. The hint here is some kind of messianic uh, future, uh, which. Heck yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so that would be where I would take this: was that everything looks bad and terrible, and out of this is born something pure and good. Would be a, a very high-level interpretation of that. But as I say, there are always cleverer people in the chat than there are um, doing uh, doing the chatting here. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sure somebody will come up with a, a more nuanced um, uh, interpretation of that. Um, uh, Nose Kill says, "Who is this humanity?" Everyone says must be saved. <laughs> Did Patchface have a pet? But seriously, I just wanted to support a great channel. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, we are, we've got about another quarter of an hour or so to go, guys. So um, now is the time to drop. If you've got any other questions, now is the time to drop them into the chat. Um, we did have uh, someone who I assume this is related to the poem rather than just a, a random thing. Margot saying it's a harpy. Uh, so uh, uh -huh. yeah, that's that's entirely possible. Um, well, while we're, um, we're while we're here, Aziz, wh why don't you give us you you've we've talked around this quite a, a lot, but in terms of your overall take, um, we know Bran apparently is the bookie's favourite. We've had some people talk about Sansa. Um, uh, maybe going to a council and all the rest of it. What what would you personally like the in terms of who's going to end up sitting on either a, an actual Iron Throne or, or the governance? What would you like to see both in the show and if it's different in the books? Yeah, I would like to see a council. Um, I would like to see, I think I would like to, for the Iron Throne to be destroyed, m m partly because I think it will be, and I'd like to be right. <laughs> you know, I'll throw a little bit of ego in there, but my, but yeah, I think as far in terms of like if I was imagining them as real people and what would be best for them, yeah, I think moving away from monarchy is would be the best. Uh, it's it would, it's not ideal, 
and not having uh you know having such power wielded by people that uh, with such little power at the bottom you know there need the bottom floor the floor needed to be raised as well as the ceiling needs to be lowered let's put it that way something that pushes things in that direction would be the best we could hope for in terms of reasonability uh reasonable uh, outcomes there but you know, this, that poem makes it all seem bleaker as far as a possibility. <laughs> as far as recency bias goes, well, that's the most recent information we have uh, from the showrunners and their musical playlist, and that's that doesn't sound great. <laughs> well, well, Natalie E., who I think uh, was involved in this earlier, saying the Yeats poem means humanity has to experience darkness before the light can shine through the cracks. But the dark imagery is to suggest that the second coming belongs to something sinister, i.e. war. So there you go. That's uh, so there are always people with better um, uh, better knowledge of these things in the chat. Um, we that. did have another couple of uh, super chats. We'll just quickly get on to uh, Leathery Wings. Thank you. Saying thank you for the awesome content. As usual, you rock. Thank you. That's very kind. Um, Dornish Dan. Thank you. Saying Robert and Aziz are two of the best commentators on Game of Thrones. Um, question: What about yeah. Game of Thrones touches or moves you to, or oh, what what about Game of Thrones moves you to do all this hard work? Um, that's a good question. So, what what hmm. what is it? Uh, Aziz, you've you've read the book several dozen times. Uh, so, what's what what is it about this that that, that kind of resonates with you? Well, I was a fan of fantasy as a young boy and just loved a lot about it. But, you know, as, as a younger person, I didn't get I wouldn't have gotten some of the things that A Song of Ice and Fire had to offer if it had existed then, which it didn't. Um, and when I read the books, I, I was given they were given to me by a friend in 2001. So I just, I read the first three. That's what was there. And I really I was super into them. And I was, the stories were compelling. I wasn't a real literature guy, but I could tell there was a lot more going on in terms of depth and writing and characterization uh, than I was used to. But I had no idea the true depth of, of that. I, I just had the sense that, hey, there seems like there's more here. And then, but the real, uh, revelation for me came with finding the the fandom, which even back then was a really powerful, albeit much smaller version of what it is now. In 2003 slash four, I started getting on Westeros.org and seeing what, like you said, there's always someone in the chat that's smarter than you. And this discovering Westeros.org was discovering hundreds of these people at once and seeing years worth of posts and theories and dissections of ideas that I had that they already were taking for granted that were completely new to me. For example, it's almost embarrassing to admit, but I did not catch R plus L equals J. And seeing that was just like, oh my goodness, because seeing people lay it out when the evidence was laid out, it was like, well, you can't deny that exactly, can you? That's just, wow, that's overwhelming. The evidence is super, super strong. And so that made me realize I had to read the books again and again and that there was so much to it. And then it just kind of grew from there. It, it became something I loved as a kid. Became the, It was the adult version of something I loved as a kid. It was an adult fantasy. And it had, it, it had a lot of people interested in it, which for me growing up, it was always a struggle finding people who were into the things I was into, like Dungeons and Dragons and other, you know, geeky role playing games and things like that. So discovering a the amount of depth and at the same moment discovering that there were a lot of other people that were into this depth, that was huge. I wanted to be a part of that community. I wanted to add to it. I was motivated to, you know, get noticed and be a part of it and uh, have, you know, be earn the respect of it because I knew it was a community that you can't you had to come with good ideas. You had to be prepared. You had to know your stuff. My first theories were terrible. <laughs> 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 if we had more time, I'd get into them. But you know, they're just you know they're they were not good. <laughs> well, 
I mean, we've all come out with not good theories uh, in in our time, I'm sure. Um, and the ones that like I like the most, I suspect, are probably the wrongest ones. Um, <laughs> yeah, probably. I, I mean, j- just to just to add on for myself, I would agree with all of that. Uh, I think that works for me as well. It's just I grew up loving fantasy and science fiction, and this is grown up fantasy and science fiction. There was I can never remember the exact quote, but C.S. Lewis w- once said. Um, uh, something along the lines of, uh, you know great fiction when you enjoy it more the second time you read it. Because it's the, the first time you can get carried along, along with the, the plot and it's exciting and there's shocks and all the rest of it. Uh, but if you go back and read something the second time and you appreciate it more because of the language, because of the layers and things like that, that is the sign of great fiction. And, mm-hmm. and for me, A Song of Ice and Fire just encapsulates that as you go back to it and you appreciate it more the more you you read it. Um, it's not just sort of frothy stuff that's just taking you along with a fast-paced story. It's actually got layers that you could read into it. So that, that for me, is what really works. Right on. Well said. Valar, reread us. <laughs> uh, George anime... knows this, too. He wrote it. He wrote these books, designed them to be reread, I think. It's quite clear. Oh, yeah, exactly. It's um, There is... Uh, the, foreshadowing and things that are there that you only realize are foreshadowing later on. Um, yeah. And I think we will go back to book one in so much extra depth when we actually get the whole series out, because there'll be so many things that he was writing there as just sort of st- setting things up that, that he then slowed the pace down as he realized this wasn't just going to be a trilogy. So there's going to be so much unpacking going on there. Well um, said. Anime lover Nicole says, will we see Dario? I did joke about this a moment ago. Or other people from Essos like Illyrio and any other folk we don't expect. Well, I'll throw those two names at you. What about Dario or Illyrio? Will we see either of them? Seriously, seriously doubt it. Uh, you know, we were we have cause for some of these random Westerosi lords and other characters to appear because of a great council slash kneeling to the new queen situation. But Dario and Illyrio showing up. They had a chance to bring Illyrio back a lot earlier, and they didn't do it. I don't know why they do it now. Dario is obviously a lot more major of a character, but still, I just don't see what his role could be um, just to show up and be somebody to take Daenerys's loneliness away. I mean, that would be something. Like, that is a big part of it. Is she's, uh, she has no friends. It's like Mary Mazdur. What is life when everything you love is gone? Uh, and she's gotten this victory of taking the throne that she's wanted since... Uh, her brother put that in her head that they that her family deserved it. But along the way, she's lost all the other things that mattered. She lost all her friends. She lost her child. She lost the uh, opportunity to have a real relationship a number of times. Same kind of thing. So that is the one thing Dario could be is like somebody that she's had a successful love with. Uh, that is the one merit. But plot wise, I just don't uh, I don't think so. Well, can I turn this into a question from T. Godson who says, can Danny live? If so, how? Is there any... I mean, I, I've been pushing heavily for this idea that she will die and she has to die, but is there a way that she might survive this? Yeah, there's a way. They could always be creative uh, with, you know, exile, banishment, or something. But I, I, I doubt it. Um, it's possible, but yeah, it doesn't seem very likely. Her, her flying off on Drogon into the sunset somewhere, that seems... It just seems like the ro- a weird, the wrong kind of story, the wrong way to end this story for her and to end her arc just ambiguously like that. Uh, so, and, you know, they want to have tragedy. They want to have surprise. And that's just neither, really. <laughs> I mean, it's a little surprising if she just goes off into the sunset, but it's not, it's not a shocking surprise. It's more of a, I didn't see that coming, but it's not like, it's not, I don't know if that it's interesting. Hmm. So, yeah. Hmm. And I would just, uh, the only thing I would add with Dario is that when you try and, at the end of this breakdown, who actually won out of all of this, I think Dario and Bronn will probably be the two characters that you go, or possibly Gendry, you go, well, they started out with not much at all. Dario's ruling a city. Bronn is going to, it would appear, um, he's going to be uh, ruling from uh, Highgarden, which is, which means that he's uh, he's in charge <laughs> of the Reach, which is the richest part of the uh, the Seven Kingdoms with the biggest army and, and the, the greatest harvests and all the rest of it. So he's going to be a massive winner. So there are some people in this who have done incredibly well. 
uh, as uh, as a very wise man once said, chaos is a ladder. It's just it worked out quick. for some of them for sure. That it's, ladder was uh, tall. <laughs> <laughs> um, Paul Atreides trade says uh, the king will be patch face. Oh oh oh! Happy Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank That's you, patch. Yeah, they kept. You're right. They kept him waiting for just this big moment. <laughs> Absolutely, it's the, the book only character who will just suddenly appear and take it all on. Um, and Lady Tia saying uh, for you and your guest and your moderators. Yes, moderators, you've been doing a fantastic job today. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, okay, I think we're going to start wrapping this one up. Um, uh, Aziz, do you want to remind everybody where they can find you in the huge wide world of the internet? Sure, yes. History of Westeros on iTunes slash Acast, SoundCloud, Google Play, Westeros History on YouTube. And actually, you know, I encourage everyone to go to Google right now and type History of Westeros just <laughs> because something very funny happens if you do so. It's actually glorious. I encourage you to do it right now, Robert. See what happens. I'm, I'm you... doing it. You keep talking for a moment. Yeah. And uh, we're going to be doing a lot of stuff after the season. We've got, like Robert said, I'm going to be doing another reread and looking for foreshadowing clues now that we've seen the way season eight played out. And we'll be talking about uh, our usual historical coverage. We're gonna we're gonna talk about House Blackwood. We've got a scripted episode coming on that. We've got an episode coming on Lomas Longstrider, and uh, so much more. So uh, check us out and uh, have fun with us. Well, I, I wish I could do one of those very clever things of showing you what what's on my Google search. But the, um, <laughs> what, do you, what do you want me to look for? Did you? Does it show you the picture? Is there a picture of? Uh, uh, at Google, for a lot of people, when you Google history of Westeros, you get a picture of me holding my cat. Uh, oh, no, I'm going to click on images now and see what I can find. Oh, yes, I see it. You're, you're, <laughs> the, the fifth picture there is of you holding your cat, who looks quite uh, aggressive, shall we say. Yeah, he's not. He wasn't pleased about being picked up there. That is uh, Jake and her cat. Uh, we call him Jake and not Jockin because he was named Jake before the TV show clarified that pronunciation and we're not going to change the cat's name after the fact. So Jake and Hakat, the cat of black and white, that is who he is. <laughs> Excellent news. Okay, guys, we're going to uh, call it a day. Oh, actually we just got one more from Bridget Walsh saying for the mods and for the future, may the episode be fulfilling and the next book come soon. Well, absolutely. Uh, guys, if you, uh, would like to uh, support this channel at all, um, the best way to do that is through Patreon. I talked about it a little bit earlier in the stream, but there is a link down in the description. Um, if you'd like uh, to get access to any of my other uh, Season 8 content, then there will, if you're watching later, there will somewhere up here be uh, a little link appearing uh, going to that. If you'd like to get access to my Patreon stuff, then somewhere up here afterwards will be appearing a link to that. Take care, guys. Enjoy the episode, and I shall see you on the other side. Thank you. Bye.